Greetings Ranger fans, Jake here for a deeper look at episode 23 of Power Rangers Dino Fury, numero uno. But first, a rapid run through. Let's kick off the counter. It's morphin' time. Okay, so we open with new opening credits. Now a Netflix series. Then we really open on a plaza where a skull face Borg's piece attacks. No name, just cool looking. And the Red Ranger comes skidding in over the rooftops, followed by Golden Green leaping out the windows, Blue coming in on the street, and Black finishing the monster in record time with a Stego Fury strike. Only three minutes, eleven seconds. But Amelia is late to the party because she's running Buzz Blast while Jane and Jay Borg are off on a worldwide ballooning tour. Hopefully not eighty days long. But Jane does call from above the Eiffel Tower to interrupt the long tracking shot of Amelia running Buzz Blast to say that it might be a few more months, and with Pop Pop off getting his warts removed, she's struggling to keep the place running clean while half the team is busy in the base. Ali facetiming his mom in Japan before helping Zeta and I on track down Rafcon. To the library! Meanwhile, at Area 62, Slyther has mucus come in like a wrecking ball, but still fails to crack open Void Night's secret room, instead seeing their old boss's face pop up on the computer screen, accompanied by a new digitally manifesting Sporex piece. Bitscreen. Ion picks up astronomy books from the library with Javi and Izzy, but a call from Fern turns glitchy as Bitscreen pops out of her phone screen, so they morph and Ion tries to put his books down, but gets smashed into a flower car. So disrespectful. They try a few finishers on Bitscreen, but he keeps going digital and then reforming, escaping and leaving the Rangers with their next challenge. A crying florist. Javi uses the fix-it dino key to fix the cart, but then Bitscreen reappears out of a security camera to snatch the key and then teleport away, tipping off the rangers that Void Knight might be back and pulling the spork strings again. No, that can't be. Amelia doesn't buy it and leaves to deal with more issues at Buzz Blast, while the others check the security cam footage through Ollie's laptop, learning the florist was really Slyther. Surprise! And the baddies were taking orders from someone on a tablet, so they decide to investigate further, but Izzy spots another glitch, loudly suggesting a plan to destroy Void Knight's Chroma Fury save. Which isn't the worst thing to do. But it's actually a fake plan to lure the baddies outside, bringing in Amelia to help plant a giant fake bomb, but when she gets distracted by a call from Buzz Blast and the others get distracted by Mucus and Slyther, Bitch Scream pops in through her phone and grabs the saber. Really? No decoy? They all morph in the villain's Retreat, but Zeno summons the T-Rex Cosmic Megazord to chase Bitscream into the internet and take him out. But not before Void Knight can use the saber and key to repair his armor, teleporting in to grab Bitscream's Sporex, just zip bursts out of the laptop, leading Amelia to later apologize to the others for prioritizing Buzz Blast. But no apology from Izzy for a bad plan. Amelia calls Step Down his head Buzz Blast, but Jane and Jay Borg return after a volcano prematurely ruined their trip and belatedly destroyed their footage. Roll credits. And that's the end of the episode. Now, let's take a deeper look. It's a new year and a new season, this time with a new platform, as this marks the first time a Power Rangers season has made its premiere debut on Netflix, after wrapping up an incredible 11-year run on Nickelodeon, well surpassing its time with Disney, and even its original 9-year run on Fox Kids. Outside of the updated opening credits indicating that this is now a Netflix series, even the episode itself appears to be crafted to mirror the franchise's new home focusing the story not only on Amelia acting as the head of a new media company, but also the chosen monster, which just so happens to have the ability to digitize itself and travel via the internet. Well, technically it was a digital dimension, but you get the idea. Power Rangers has officially moved to the World Wide Web of cat videos. Very interestingly, this was not originally going to be the case, as according to recent Twitter statements from showrunner Simon Bennett, Dino Fury was initially developed as a single 22-episode season, likely relating to the impending end of Hasbro's contract with Nickelodeon, but it was later updated to a 44-episode order, likely after confirming the move to Netflix. This means the original story was reworked so that it would be structured across the course of two years instead of one, with 22 additional episodes written to plug the gaps and fill out the expanded story. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would expect that this story was not part of that original 22 episode order. Note that this is only conjecture on my part, but hear me out real quick. Both Void Trap and Numero Uno are structured to create a very clear break in the story, having the main villain suddenly switch up his goals from collecting Sporex energy to going after Morphin Grid energy, only for it to literally blow up in his face at the end of Void Trap and take him out of the action for an undisclosed time jump that wraps up with a full return to status quo by the end of Numero Uno. The fake-out resolution and the time jump feel tailor-made to function as a season finale slash season premiere pairing, which obviously wouldn't have existed if the story was was originally just a single season, especially since the return of everyone's powers and Void Knight jumping right back to stealing Sporex functionally resets everything to where it was right before the events of Void Trap. Well, technically this could be expanded to include much of Secret Santa, Waking Nightmares, and the makeover as well, since the sparse use of the Cosmic Raptor Zord in the original source material meant that it could potentially have been skipped over entirely, but you get my point. And yes, I will be theorizing about a lot of episodes moving forward. This entire approach to structuring the story is absolutely fascinating to me, and I really wonder how many individual scenes and full-on story arcs may have been added after the original development phase. 
But putting aside whether or not Numero Uno was part of the original story, let's take a look at how well it functions in its role within the two-season structure, as the role of the second season premiere has often been a bit of a tricky needle to thread across the course of the last decade, though not nearly so challenging as the first season finale tends to be. While a series premiere is meant to introduce the story, the characters, and their world, a second season premiere is meant to reintroduce all of these elements and establish what, if any, changes have been made to the status quo. And, as we've already established, those changes are basically non-existent in this case. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as it does provide extra breathing room to reintroduce all of those pre-existing story elements. Previous installments have definitely pushed for a clear differentiation between the first season and the second super season, with the most prominent example being Megaforce and Super Megaforce adapting completely different Sentai series. But we've also had things like Dino Charge and Ninja Steel changing up their primary antagonists, or Samurai upgrading the Rangers with a new power-up. Up until now, Beast Morphers probably had the least cosmetic differentiation between the two seasons, as it not only eschewed the super label of its predecessors, but also kept the same villains, slowly providing them with upgraded forms and waiting until a few episodes later to upgrade the Rangers in turn. Although I suppose it could be argued that Samurai had even less of a substantial change, since all they did was slap a white vest on one Ranger at a time, but they were really trying to make that whole super label work. However, I am trying to focus specifically on the status quo changes depicted in their respective season premieres, and that's the thing that's interestingly absent here. As I stated before, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, as it means that the main focus of the episode is placed on reconnecting to the characters and re-establishing the arc of the story, rather than also trying to shoe in some new merchandising for the toy line. And the first half of this episode does a really great job of that. Not only do we get a spectacularly dynamic entry from our rangers against the unnamed Sporks Beast, and a seamless long take of Amelia running Buzz Blast, but we also get to check in with just about every supporting character of the series before the end of the first act, with the somewhat odd exception of Warden Garcia. Not that he really had any connection to the story here, but it was still a little odd that he didn't get a shout-out like Pop Pop or Fern. Actually, I don't think we've heard from him at all since Crossed Wire, so maybe the whole sleep bomb incident renewed his childhood love of naps and he's just been taking a nice long rest. But for basically everyone else, we do get a pretty good idea here of what they've been up to since we last saw them, nicely reinforcing their character traits. Zato and Ion continue to search for their home planet of Ravcon, Amelia is stepping up at Buzz Blast, Javi is utilizing his musical talent to compose theme jingles, Izzy is still dating Fern and pushing the team to be at their athletic peak, and Ollie is enjoying a more open and honest relationship with his mom. All the little appearances and shoutouts to the other supporting characters is great as well, as we not only get those aforementioned shoutouts and get to see Jane and Jayborg wrapping up their world tour, but we also get to see a bit more from the Buzz Blast background cast, getting a rare speaking line from Annie, and a surprising amount of prominence for Stan through his increasingly frantic calls to Amelia. Speaking of which, Stan. Stan? What do you mean the tripod doesn't work? What is it supposed to be doing that it's not doing? Are the legs not fully extending? Then get a box or something to put it on. This is a segment on ice cream cakes, right? It's not like you need a lot of tilting or panning. Or if you do, then just hold the camera. If you're looking to do tilting or panning, then you must have a camera operator. Just have the camera operator hold the camera. It's obviously not ideal, but how long is this segment on ice cream cakes going to be? You've already said that they're melting. You need to move on this, man. Look, all I'm saying is that we're all clearly under a lot of pressure right now, and we just appreciate it if you could show a little bit of initiative instead of trying to have someone troubleshoot a faulty tripod via phone conference. This is why Jane didn't leave you in charge. But before I get into another tangent on why Pop Pop is the one they want to bring in to address a server issue and not, say, a designated company IT guy, I do want to address the actual story of the episode and why I feel like the second half isn't quite so strong as the first. We get a lot of good setup and fun character moments during the first half of this episode, with Slyther's manipulation of the Rangers' goodwill being a genuinely clever plot to capture the fix-it key. But once we move past that point, we start to hit a a similar issue to what we encountered in Void Trap. The Rangers have to fail for the plot to move forward, but the framing of that failure is completely at odds with what's actually happening. The Rangers' plans aren't failing because of external circumstances, the plans are failing because they are bad plans executed badly, and none of them seem to realize this. While it is clever in the moment for Izzy to lay a trap to lure out the villains, the nature of the trap is never really fleshed out, as there was no clear indication of how this was ever supposed to end well, and no one is ever given any clear roles to play other than stand around in Dino Henge loudly proclaiming that they're about to destroy Void Knight's Chroma Fury Saber, and... I'm sorry, but why don't they just do that? 
Like, they're going through all this trouble to lure out the villains to prove that Void Knight's alive, but they're taking an incredible risk by taking the actual Chroma Fury Saber out of the base when it was already established in the matchmaker that they have a double key that explicitly makes false copies of things for the purposes of fooling their enemies. Like, why would you make the bomb fake and not the sword? Why not do it the other way around? That way, even if the villains make it past you, you can still hit the button and blow them up and you've risked nothing. I just, I genuinely do not understand what the win scenario was supposed to be here. Even the part that ostensibly goes wrong isn't really the thing that goes wrong here. As the situation is framed to make it look like Bitscream is able to retrieve the sword specifically because Amelia is distracted by her buzz blast duties, but the other five rangers were already allowing themselves to be distracted by Slyther and Mucus. And unless Amelia was being designated as the lone lookout to keep an eye on the bomb, which was not stated and would make no sense considering her obviously distracted state, then one could only assume that if she were paying attention, then she would have just been distracted by Slyther and Mucus along with the rest of them. The idea behind this scenario is fine. The idea that Amelia's overcommitment leads to the villains getting the upper hand against the rangers is a good one, but for it to work, we need to be able to actually tell the difference between the plan falling apart and the plan just being flawed from the start. You can't really blame Amelia for failing in a role that was never actually established to the audience. You may want to occasionally obscure a plan to surprise your audience with its success, but if the plan is going to fail, then you need to clearly display what that point of failure is if you want to hold a character responsible. So much of this situation could have worked if only the nature of the plan and the nature of Bitscream's powers were better defined. Like, why is it that he can spy on the rangers in the base, but not just appear in the base? Wouldn't that have defeated the whole purpose of setting up the ploy with Slyther and the flower cart? Just a few lines of exposition could have done so much here. Maybe those shields on the base prevent enemy teleportation, but not eavesdropping. Maybe the laptop was supposed to be the only digital device at Dinohenge, and Amelia's actual mistake was not leaving her phone behind. Maybe they couldn't leave the real Chroma Fury Saber behind because they were nervous that Bitscream would learn about the deception through some other digital device, and it would ruin the scheme. But then why would they even bother saying the plan out loud if they were afraid the location was compromised? Okay, okay, maybe there's not actually a good reason for using the real Chroma Fury Saber. In that case, make that be a mistake too. Maybe the others were busy constructing the bomb and Amelia wasn't paying enough attention to realize she was supposed to bring a duplicate. I don't want it to seem like I'm being overly harsh on the writers here, as the first half of the episode is genuinely quite strong and really does highlight the large cast that the series has accrued over the course of the first season, even if the second half does fall into the common season one pitfall of the lesson of the day being at odds with the actual events of the story. And I do want to offer my heartfelt congratulations to Becca Barnes, who is now, with this being her eighth season on the show, achieved the record for more consecutive seasons of Power Rangers than any other writer to date, a record originally set by Mark Litton during Lightspeed Rescue, and later matched by Jackie Marchand and John Telgen during the Disney era with unbroken streaks of seven seasons in a row, but never surpassed until now. Hopefully, once the global health crisis subsides, you'll be able to celebrate like Sledge by throwing up your hands and having fun in Japan. You've earned it. So make sure to join me next time for a deeper look at episode 24 of Power Rangers Dino Fury, The Festival. And if you would like to share this week's rapid run-through, you can find it as a standalone clip over at Morphin Legacy's YouTube channel. Please like, share, subscribe to us both, ring the bell for future notifications, and until next time, farewell Ranger fans, and let the power protect you.